Welcome to Digit Debates Summer Series, and I'm uh, very pleased to see so many people have come to this, although the distractions are holidays. I'm really delighted to uh, have Professor Novi Quadrianto here today to talk to us about the work he's been doing around algorithmic fairness and transparency. Um, Novi and I met in pre-COVID days, in, uh, it seems like years ago now, when we were talking about the centre and uh, I was saying how one of the questions we don't know is how algorithms deal with bias or reproduce bias. And Novi was like, yes, we do know how to do that. We know how to audit and monitor algorithms or that was what his new European Research Council grant set out to do. So a group of us, including Will Hunt and Richard Dickens and myself set over in their labs trying to understand how do informatics, machine learning professors and analyze or audit algorithms to understand what fairness um, is or isn't when it isn't isn't happening. So that was a conversation we started a few years ago. Since then, we've all been very busy with uh, been locked in at home, but now we're all back again. And also Novi has also been leading on this European Research Council grant he's had on fairness. He also has a new uh, Horizon grant on uh, from Tango looking at human machine interaction, which is great to see he's still contributing to the European debates. And he's also involved in some work with the uh, Bank of Indonesia and FinTech, looking at how uh, AI can be useful in some of the decision makings made in finance. And it's another area of collaboration we want to look at. And Novi was also fundamental in setting up the Predictive Analytics Lab at Sussex and collaborations he has also with Bill Bow. So he's got, he's spread across many continents doing at the forefront of research in this area. So Novi, I'm going to hand over to you and I'm really pleased that you're going to explain to us what do informatics professors, how do they understand fairness and algorithmic decision making and enlighten us all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you uh, for the invitation and thank you for coming, uh, everyone. So I'm going to share my slides. Uh, yeah. So hopefully everyone can see uh, my slides. Uh, I'm going to talk about from algorithmic robustness to algorithmic fairness and back. Uh, and the algorithmic systems that uh, I'm referring to is machine learning and artificial intelligent uh, algorithms. So ML and AI algorithms. Since I'm talking about AI algorithms, I should be addressing uh, the elephant in the room first. Uh, that's uh, AI poses a risk of extinction. So I will let my very good friend, uh, Professor Andrew Ng to, to summarize the current conversation about this uh, particular big elephant. Hi, I'd like to have a real conversation about whether AI poses a risk of extinction for the human race. I've worked on AI for many years, including starting and leading Google Brain, serving as director of the Santa AI Lab, and now leading Deep Learning.AI, AI Fund, and Landing AI. Last week, Safe.AI put out a statement that said, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. This was signed by many people, including AI scientists who I really respect. But I have to admit, I don't get it. I'm struggling to see how AI could pose any meaningful risk for our extinction. No doubt, AI has many risks, like bias, fairness, inaccurate outputs, job displacement, concentration of power, but I see AI's net impact as massively contributing to society, and I don't see how it can lead to human extinction. Yeah, so uh, as a follow-up that, to that particular video, actually, Professor Andrew Ng is currently making conversation uh, with those uh, godfathers of AI and other AI scientists uh, that poses this, that AI uh, pose a risk of extinction. And they agreed that they will make uh, or articulate uh, better the risk and also make a risk table, uh, perhaps with the likelihood of harm, severity of the harm and the overall risk, like when we are making our research proposal and talking about the risk of our 
uh, project proposal. But what uh, uh, Professor Andrew Ng mentioning is actually currently the current AI system already poses real risk that we should be start uh, working on, we should be start uh, focusing on, which is bias, fairness, and inaccuracy. So those three are the, the focus of my uh, presentation today. Job displacement, I think this is the digit research is, is the expertise in there. So let me just focus on this uh, bias, fairness, and inaccuracy. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. And, and the next step is just to frame this conversation about uh, AI. This is another uh, very good source about describing what is the AI landscape at the moment. This is from IBM Research AI, where AI can be described in terms of like narrow AI, which is a technology which is emerging. This is when the AI uh, focusing on a single task, uh, a particular task to recognize digit, a particular task of recognizing uh, object, cats or dogs, single domain, but it has superhuman accuracy and, and, and very fast uh, uh, speed or processing for certain tasks. So that's the state of the narrow AI. But the next step of the AI uh, uh, perspective is broad AI. So this is where the AI technology will be disruptive and pervasive. And this is where the AI can do with the multi-tasks, multi-domain, multi-model, distributed AI, and the conversation about explainability uh, uh, fairness and transparency will be uh, relevant in this particular uh, broad uh, AI. And then the next step about this broad AI is the, the general AI. This is when it is revolutionary, where the AI can do cross-domain, not only learning, but reasoning. Uh, so we can do a learning and reasoning. It also has broad autonomy. And this is the one that is, uh, you know, when, when we are uh, talking about whether there is a potential of, of uh, posing existential risk, this will be the general AI conversation where the IBM research putting the timeline as 2050 and beyond, which is like, you know, it's, it's further uh, away in the futures. Where we are now is actually we are in between this narrow and broad AI. We are just transitioning from the narrow AI to the broad AI. And, and the next question now here is like, what is the current problem of the AI? Why it is called narrow? I mean, what is so narrow about uh, the current AI system? This is an example of AI system called object detector. So this is AI system that you are given an image and then you try to uh, locate by providing bounding box and say that, what is that particular uh, object inside that particular bounding box? Current generation algorithm, they are not robust. They are misusing context, occluder information. So here, as you can see, the, the image on the left-hand side, uh, there is actually a picture of, of monkey, but it's detected as a person because when you occlude it with a motorbike, the AI picking up like, you know, motorbike and person always uh, uh, happening at the same time, always correlating. So if you see that motorbike, then the other one must be person because it misusing context or occluder information. And, and the, the other pictures, uh, which is the one, uh, uh, wait, sorry. The one on the, the one on the right, this is misusing in terms of uh, the background itself. We have an object, which is, you know, uh, very colorful uh, uh, a guitar, but the background is like uh, a tropical forest. So the AI system will think that, oh, this is very colorful thing in the tropical forest. It must be bird. So that's like, you know, the current AI system narrow because it used too much information from the background without relying on the object of interest itself. So that's the current state of the object detector. And the next step of AI system, for example, object recognition. So this is when you are given an image and then you would like to recognize what are the objects there? Is there any person? Is there any house or whatever things? And, and in here again, the AI systems is responding to frequently occurring background where we have uh, uh, water, it must be a, a, a lifeboat or a boathouse. It's, it's, it's uh, wrongly uh, picking up this particular situation where it is actually coming from the uh, hurricane uh, 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 image. Uh, and, and this particular uh, models, uh, you can have a look or you can have a try from the hugging face. Uh, it's available uh, online and this is uh, a Google uh, state-of-the-art uh, visual transformer 
uh, AI models. So it's like the state-of-the-art model, it's still not robust because they are relying too much on the background. So that's object recognition. The last, the last example is uh, the current trend as well. You use AI system, you have an image, and then you try to uh, ask the AI system to provide captioning. So this is image captioning problems. Uh, and again, this particular image, uh, uh, the caption is there is a small animal that is standing on a tire. Well, we don't see the tire. And, and <laughs> it just because perhaps like this particular animal, squirrel and tire, they are always together and, and or misusing uh, uh, the background of the uh, uh, desert. And then it's, it's concluded that there is a tire as well there. So uh, 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 across range of AI systems, there is a, a notion that the system currently narrow because they are not robust. They are using uh, the information that is not supposed to be using, which is in this case is the background information, which is uh, uh, frequently occurring uh, information. So why this, what is the problem? Uh, why it is a problem? It's, it is a problem because uh, there is a, a difference between a training distribution and deployment or task distribution. If there is no difference between training and uh, uh, deployment, there will not be uh, a problem related to the robustness. So here, another example of uh, images from camera trap. And per perhaps you would like to try to uh, identify the animal species from this camera trap. And in your training data, you have the camera trap, which is located in South America. And in the test data, you have the camera trap, which is also from South America, but also uh, from Asia. So you have this mismatch that, you know, you are having the training data, which is just coming from South America, but you wanted to deploy it. You wanted to test, you want to use your AI algorithm uh, in different location in here in Asia and different uh, location, different camera trap will have different uh, variation of the images that are being produced, for example, the object location or the illumination or anything in terms of the background information. That is what is typical in, in South America and what is typical in Asia. But what you are interested in is just to try to pick up the objects, the animal species. You wanted to know that this is still uh, a particular uh, animals, regardless whether the background is South America or uh, Asia. So the current problems of uh, AI algorithm, narrow, you can summarize in, in, in the one word, uh, uh, one sentence, it is about out of distribution generalization. The AI system cannot generalize when you are deploying at the different uh, location, different uh, uh, demographic uh, uh, groups. If you have your training data from the uh, Asia and you wanted to apply it uh, to Europe population or reverse, this will be having an out of distribution uh, generalization. Uh, and so noticing that there is this problem about out of distribution, uh, we need to have uh, AI systems uh, that will be able to handle this discrepancy between training and deployment or tasks. So how do we do that? And, and another one uh, word to, to, to summarize uh, the solution will be invariance. So we would like the AI algorithm to be invariant to the location, invariant to the background information, invariant whether you are taking it from South America or Asia, invariant to the demographic groups, which is defined based on the race, sex, uh, uh, religions. And this, this keyword invariance uh, is the one that is uh, we are trying to uh, focus on and will be helpful for us to address this out of distribution generalization. So what is, what is invariant? What is an example of invariance? What is the state of the invariants that are being already uh, uh, deployed in the, in the AI and machine learning systems? So the first type or the simplest invariant, if we talk about uh, images. So most of my examples are, are images, uh, uh, other examples related to text or tabular data. You can find it in the in the relevant papers that we have, but just I thought images are, are nicer to, to visualize and, and to think about. Uh, and it should be generalized in terms of like, you know, out of distribution invariance uh, concept itself. Translation invariance, you wanted to recognize that this is a, a, 
a dog and whether the dog is on the left hand side or whether the dog is on the right hand side you wanted to still recognize that that is a dog you don't want to just have the system that is you know i can only recognize it as a dog because my training data are having the dog all on the left hand side i can only recognize when the dog in the tasks or the deployment are located on the left hand side that's not uh, what you want. What you want is to have a systems that is translation invariant, should predict the same category that is a dog, regardless of the location of the object. And the first thing that we can do to achieve this translation invariant is actually encode these invariants directly into the uh, AI uh, machine learning models. Uh, one example is using so-called operation convolution. So this is the, the visualization of convolution. You just have a, a sliding window that, uh, you know, try to find uh, activation and scanning the image. So the first layer of that visualization is the image. And then uh, the one that the middle is so-called convolution filter. So it's just scanning. And you can see that, you know, it's it scanned the whole uh, location of the image. And with the, uh, combining this convolution and uh, pulling uh, operation, uh, we will get this kind of like translation invariance. So you can encode invariance uh, directly into the machine learning models. But this is translation invariance. This is this is the simplest invariance. But how can we make sure that this robust invariant with other uh, more complex things? Then you can go into uh, th the next step, which is like you know how. Can you not only recognize whether the objects are in the different location, left or right, but how about if the object is sometimes uh, turned upside down, uh, uh, move a little bit uh, with the angle, etc. So you can actually achieve like other type of invariance to make the, the models to be uh, robust and, and to be invariant with, with many, many, many uh, uh, changes by using this kind of data augmentation. So this is like you, you need to convert a single image into several uh, images. And these several images, you can do it with contrast changes, uh, dropping a particular uh, regions of the image. Uh, you can do cropping, padding, blurring. So this is, this is a standard technique uh, in the AI machine learning to make the system more robust by doing data augmentation. This you are encoding invariants by having a very large data set. So you have a single image, you, you apply so many transformation and you do that for each single data point in your training data. Then actually you have a very large data set which define the transformation the model is invariant to. So the invariance is encoded in terms of the data augmentation operation that you are uh, applying. So that's the already like, you know, translation invariant and other uh, invariants. Uh, and, and the next step is like, can we even achieve further uh, invariants? Can we even make it uh, the models even more robust? And, and this is now uh, really uh, the, the current state of the machine learning is so-called building a large models, which we call it a foundation models or uh, a base models. This is using scrap the whole uh, data from the internet. Uh, if you are uh, uh, knows about GPT-4, uh, chat GPT, etc. So this is part of the foundation models that the way they try to achieve robustness or invariance is try to get as many data as possible that you can get. And you build a large model trained in the very large quantity of data that is uh, resulting in the base model that can be applied into many tasks, into range of tasks. So that's the multi-task question about the uh, broad AI. A particular uh, uh, models, particular foundation model is so-called so clip models. In here is like, what you have is like, you know, you have a data that you have an image of a black car, uh, and then you have this particular caption. I took a picture of a black car. And then another image is, I took a picture of a black car. And, and what they, they do or what we try to do is just to try to learn uh, uh, features or representation of this particular uh, image so that if the image have the same caption, a picture of a black car, they will be located uh, close to its other. So in here, you can see that, you know, the black car, the first black car have the background, which is, you know, trees and, and, and more greenery. 
you will still recognize that there's a black car because you know the other uh, pictures of a black car we have these very city things then the the models somehow will be invariance to the background it will not take into account this uh, a different uh, uh, background still recognize that it is a black car uh, despite this different background so this is the hope of invariant by learning very 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 large data set and and a word of caution with this kind of uh, foundation uh, models or a base model is too excessive invariant might be very harmful so just now i was giving examples like you know if your task is to recognize uh, uh, a black car then it will be invariance to the uh, to the to the background but imagine if we want to use this foundation model or the base model for a task which is recognized red and green traffic light. <laughs> and in here, the red and the green is actually at the background. And uh, I was already mentioning that they are actually invariant. They don't care about the red and the green. <laughs> so if you wanted to apply this particular uh, machine learning models for the red and the green, it will be invariant. It will not be understanding uh, whether the traffic light is a red or traffic light is a green because it looks the same to them. And that's what the word of caution, when we wanted to uh, embed robustness or invariance, invariance in general is good, but too excessive invariance uh, will be uh, dangerous for our uh, downstream application. So here is the connection between robustness and, and invariance. I, I talk so much about out of distribution, uh, generalization, and then invariance, but just here to ground this, uh, what do I mean between uh, robustness and invariance? Robustness, in general, what we mean is like, you know, we wanted to ensure the machine learning models, AI models, they have good performance, even when encountering situation different from training, when they are being used in a different location. You have the system that is applied, uh, that is trained from South America, uh, South American population, you wanted to apply to the to the Asian population, it still have a good performance. You can achieve this robustness by invariance when you have uh, uh, when you uh, uh, define your training data, which is supposed to be as large as possible, or as uh, what what you define there, the data uh, creation as your training data. But you need to embed invariance, and here the keyword is targeted invariance because. You want to make sure that the invariance will not be too excessive. With that, you will get robustness. So that's the, the connection between uh, invariance and robustness. When you have targeted invariances, when you define the target, what do you want to be invariant uh, of? Then you will get uh, the models that is robust. You want it to be invariant with respect to the background. Uh, is it the whole background or with specific backgrounds that you want it to be invariant of? Uh, and 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 the next step is like invariance can be also used to 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 uh, define like invariance. I was mentioning uh, more about invariance to background, like uh, ignoring the background or not taking into account uh, the background. But you can also talk about invariance to 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 subgroup. In here, the subgroup, uh, the connection with the algorithmic fairness or algorithmic bias is the subgroup. It can be a uh, domain, environment, water or land, or uh, South America or, or Asia, but it can also be a specific demographic attribute such as uh, uh, males or females. So you can actually ask as well, the machine learning models to be invariant to the subgroup, uh, invariant to the demographic attributes. The examples on the left-hand side here is like, when you have uh, the tax, this is uh, a standard uh, benchmark, a data set in, in algorithmic fairness, so-called so CELEP uh, attributes. So you wanted to, 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 to predict whether a particular person is blonde or not blonde, but there is this uh, demographic attribute, which is male and females. And you wanted to, to make sure that uh, the performance of the algorithms uh, when it's predicting blonde and not blonde to be invariant to the uh, male and females. So the performance of the male uh, uh, population should be as good as the female uh, population, for example. And, and given that the data creation process that we have might not be uh, perfect. So maybe like in our data, we don't have many uh, female that is non-blonde, or we don't have many uh, uh, images that is male and blonde. So we have the data creation process as what uh, we, we define but we still get uh, robustness. We can still get 
uh, invariance when we try to define like what would be our targeted invariance with this particular application that we are interested in. In here, the target, for example, is the demographic attributes, demographic uh, uh, subgroups. And, and this is an example of unfair algorithm where on average across the male and female population, the performance is high, but if you look into, for example, the, the male or the females uh, within each of the subgroup, then the performance can be low. That is would be an example of an unfair uh, algorithm. So, so how does the connection between this invariance and, and fairness? Uh, so what, what, what I've been uh, spending actually already for almost uh, half an hour, just laying out like the the current states of uh, 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 conversation in terms of like robustness, fairness, and invariance. So, I mean, just, I know that the, there will be a question uh, later on, but if in the meantime, you have some uh, question, you would like to clarify anything, uh, please uh, let me know. You can raise your hand. Uh, here is just uh, a slide on connecting between uh, invariance and, and fairness. So fairness, as, as you uh, already perhaps like uh, infer from what I'm saying about uh, in terms of the performance, in terms of informatics uh, way or computer science way to try to, to, to define this notion of fairness is uh, we have two big uh, 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 grouping of this fairness, which is parity fairness that models should have uh, almost equal performance across different subgroups. So the performance of the male subgroup need to be the same as the performance of female subgroup. That's parity uh, fairness. Uh, and, and the second thing is it can be in terms of minimax uh, fairness. So that's like, you know, the models should focus on the worst uh, subgroup and try to improve uh, the performance of that particular worst uh, subgroup. So that's that's the two notion of uh, parity and the minimax uh, fairness. So, so again, here, uh, you can achieve uh, fairness with the same procedure as what you do with the robustness. You have your data uh, training data, which is defining your data curation process. What is your training data? And then what you wanted is you wanted to have a targeted invariance where the target here, it will be the subgroup, will be the demographic attributes that you are uh, interested to, to, to be invariant of. So, Could I just ask a quick question? Yeah. How do you know that the worst subgroup, how do you know when they got it wrong? How, how do you, who picks up that mistake? Yeah, so so in here it's like when we try to uh, assess uh, the performance, like we have our uh, training data and then we have our uh, deployment uh, data. So usually like you assess it in terms of your deployment because of there is this discrepancy between training and the deployment. And then you will notice that actually my algorithm that I train, which is like uh, trained with this uh, European population, when I wanted to deploy it to some subgroup uh, in, in, in Europe or, or some uh, other population, it's actually having the performance that is depicted on the right hand side here, that actually the average accuracy is really good. But you notice that because you already defined the demographic attribute that you are interested in, oh, for this particular on this demographic attribute, the performance is actually very bad. So you assess that on your uh, deployment on the, on the test, because if there is no discrepancy between the training and the deployment, then you usually uh, will will have an algorithm that is more or less uh, robust, more or less uh, not biased. I think the 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 not robust and uh, not fair comes from this discrepancy between training and deployment. And that's why you need to check it on the deployment uh, side. Thank you. Any other clarification? Uh, no, it looks like you, oh, you can go on, go ahead. Okay. But if uh, anybody if anybody does have any questions, please feel you can ask questions as you go along yes. as well. So, you know, uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to be as informative as, as possible, maybe not uh, achieving that. So you, you can help me to at least achieving uh, closer to that particular goal. So my message is just like, you know, you have the data 
trading data that you are curating. I mean, like that you are trying to collect, gather to do some machine learning or artificial intelligence. So that data creation process, what you need to do from that data creation process is try to define some invariances that you are interested in. In order for you to get robustness, then maybe you want to be invariant to the location, situation, background, or you want to get fairness. Then you want to be invariant to certain uh, demographic uh, attributes that is defined by protected characteristic, uh, for example. So the goal is to have targeted invariances, as <laughs> was uh, described in a, a previous uh, few slides. So actually, uh, what I'm going to uh, describe briefly is one specific methods or one example of the method that you can achieve this uh, targeted <laughs> invariance. You can achieve targeted invariance with explicitly defined uh, targets. So what is the target? Is it the demographic attributes or the, the background? Or you can actually achieve as well targeted invariance with implicitly defined targets. So you don't really um, uh, explicitly define the target because you don't know what is the demographic attributes that you would like to be uh, fair uh, with respect to. So that will be uh, the second part, but I will discuss in detail uh, the one with explicit and then uh, with the implicitly defined target, I will discuss uh, very briefly. And, and this is uh, a joint work uh, with uh, Sarah, Miles, uh, Chris, and, and Victoria. So for more description about uh, the methods, et cetera, please uh, refer to the uh, two paper that is stated here. So what I'm trying to summarize here is like, how are we able to get uh, targeted uh, invariance using method that perhaps most of us already very familiar with? Uh, statistical matching uh, methods. So this is a method that you know uh, we are using to to assess uh, the effect of a particular uh, treatment. So in here in statistical matching, you have you know the uh, treated groups, and then you wanted to assess the effect of a particular treatment. You need to define or you need to find some control group. Uh, so you have a treated group, and then you have control group, and then you see what's the particular uh, effect of uh, a particular treatment that you are giving. How do you bring this or how do you use this for a bit more high dimensional data such as images or uh, text? So this is what uh, we are trying to do. Here is we use this uh, statistical matching, uh, view it as a method to do data augmentation. So we have a, a, a data and then we would like to augment, we would like to add more uh, data point to achieve a particular uh, invariance that we are interested in. And in here, we are already given the target. The target is, for example, a uh, male and a female. And the augmentation is we start with uh, data, which is all males. And we would like to find, or use a statistical matching to find uh, the match uh, female version. Or if we have the first uh, female uh, data, we would like to augment with the male uh, images. So this is the idea of uh, statistical matching. You start with uh, one particular uh, target subgroup, female, you want to find matches of the males. You start with the male, and then you want to find uh, the female uh, uh, matching. And then here we use the standard, like, you know, nearest neighbor matching with uh, Euclidean distance and, uh, and the covariates just using some uh, pre-trained uh, uh, models that is like very large uh, models that give us uh, the the covariates itself. And what we are asking is like, can we use uh, statistical matching to try to do a targeted invariance and achieving uh, fairness? Uh, the question, uh, uh, the answer is like with the standard statistical matching, uh, it's it's possible, but it's not uh, achieving achieving what we wanted uh, in in general to be targeted invariance with respect to the uh, male and females because the data is just so high dimensional. And there is a lot of these false positive matches. Like, you know, you have a match between a male to the female or female to the male, but a lot of them are actually false positive uh, matches. And what, what we are trying to, uh, to do actually, like how can we drop some uh, data points that maybe we couldn't find 
uh, a good matches in that. And that's like, you know, a standard technique as well, uh, using a propensity score uh, based uh, caliper. So this is exactly what, what we are doing. We, we define a propensity score, which is uh, a score or probabilistic uh, uh, likelihood of being a particular subgroup male or the females. And, and what we do is this propensity score sometimes in the high dimensional data is very is very uh, picky. So it's like, what is the probability of this particular uh, data points to be belonging to the female subgroup? It's always most likely close to the 0 0.9999. So it's a very high uh, probability. And, and, and this, is, this is not a good uh, uh, propensity score to do, to do statistical matching. So what, what we do is like to try to do a temperature scaling here to reduce like uh, the propensity score values to be not very picky. This is what we have it here in terms of the scaling. Uh, instead of using the orange propensity score, we use the, the blue uh, propensity score. And, and the next step, uh, what, what we do is use this particular uh, propensity score uh, to, to, to do a fixed uh, caliper and uh, 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 a standard uh, deviation-based uh, caliper to, to, to actually drop some of the data points. Because here uh, the, the intuition is some data point probably is too characteristic of belonging to certain uh, subgroup. Some data points are too characteristic to belonging uh, female or too characteristic to be belonging uh, to the uh, male subgroup. So then we should just drop them instead of using them to help with the targeted invariance. And, and we just use like the rest of the data point that is not being uh, dropped uh, as uh, a new data, augmented data, where you have male and the females that are mostly closely matched to one another. So in here, it's like, you know, you have the data creation process, the data, the starting point of the data that is perhaps not very balanced in terms of the male, females, perhaps like, you know, the problems that is related to the female or male are more difficult in terms of the tasks that you are having and what this particular targeted invariance using statistical matching try to, to achieve is to define a bit better balanced data set. And here we denote it as a D star. So you started with the D uh, data set and you define your uh, target uh, that you wanted to be invariant to, and you get your uh, D star as your augmented uh, data set. So this is how you use uh, a statistical matching uh, for targeted invariance where the covariance is actually already uh, defined by based on some uh, other pre-trained models. And, and we can actually visualize like, you know, what is the uh, visualization in terms of the match uh, data set. So in here, you know, uh, the matches between uh, a females and, and, and the males and the male to the females. So we do uh, both way because we, we didn't try to do this one-to-one -one matching, et cetera. So we just do just uh, uh, any matching, but we do it from male to females and female to the males. Actually, the statistical matching preserve characteristic across match pair, such as the pose, facial expression accessories. We don't encode that, but it, it take into account this particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, invariance that perhaps we wanted to be, uh, to be, to be removing this, to be removing uh, the pose, uh, to be removing the facial expression and accessories information. So that's the match data set. And you can actually do this kind of like augmenting with a so-called generative adversarial networks. I don't know whether uh, some of you perhaps heard that like, that's like, you know, uh, models that can generate uh, synthetic uh, images or just some uh, fake images. And you can actually do that as well. And that's one models that try to do so-called cycle gun. You can try to augment uh, with using this uh, synthetically generated examples. We will show it like, you know, this is, is a good, in one way or another to use this synthetically generated uh, examples, but it's also not good because you require another training data to, to train this particular uh, generative adversarial networks. And then of course that now you have a question again about your invariance and robustness or invariance and the fairness with respect to this uh, synthetically generated uh, example as well. And what you can do is, uh, I'm going to just uh, skip this, like, you know, you have the uh, a data set that is a D star, you can use uh, uh, 
use it to train machine learning model. And when you're training machine learning model, uh, we usually define some loss or regularization. Regularization is like to make sure that the machine uh, learning model is not only memorizing your training data. The loss is only about training data. The regularization is like, you know, your model should take into account the deployment as well. And that's self-consistency regularization in this case is the one that encoding that match data set. Because again, uh, this is talking about the discrepancy between training and deployment out of distribution. So it makes sense for us to put it into this regularization in terms of the match uh, data set. Then we do some uh, 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 comparisons, like, you know, this is the way we assess typically in terms of like, you know, fairness and bias. We produce this kind of, uh, an example of the metric that we, that we produce is, we produce an aggregate accuracy. So this is the standard accuracy or F1 score or precision recalls on the whole, <laughs> Uh, deployment data. So this is like, you know, if you have 1 million uh, deployment data point, just compute whatever performance metric you are interested in. And then you can do so-called robust accuracy. So this is the one that is taking into account minimax of fairness. So this is what is the performance in the worst uh, uh, a subgroup, in the worst demographic attributes. If you have like 10 demographic attributes, then of course you just compute your accuracy on those 10 uh, demographic attributes. And then you actually report the worst among the 10 uh, demographic attributes. And then you compare the performance in terms of like how the particular algorithm achieve on those worst uh, demographic attributes. Because what, what you want, what you don't want is like the algorithm that is very good in terms of aggregate, but sacrifice a lot in terms of uh, a worse subgroup. So here is like the first line of this algorithm, ERM. This is a very standard machine learning algorithm, focuses on aggregate accuracy. As you can see that the aggregate accuracy is, is the highest, like, you know, 89%, almost 90%. But the worst subgroup is 55.3. So it's like, you know, almost random guessing for a particular uh, subgroup, which is the worst. This is not what you, you want. What you want is like aggregate accuracy to be to be high, but the worst subgroup will also be, be high. And that's that's what we are aiming. Uh, and, and, and what our method was using this uh, statistical matching is try to maintain this aggregate accuracy and then try to, to improve in terms of this uh, worst case uh, performance worst case uh, subgroup. So that's what one way uh, that informatics uh, define this fairness. But you can also do the uh, the parity. What would be the performance in the uh, subgroup A and what's performance of subgroup B, and then you try to compute uh, the difference. So I'm 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 probably will just uh, spend like uh, two minutes just to quickly go through uh, what is in the next slide, and happy to uh, ask a question or. Uh, give more clarification. So uh, previously, what I described was like, you know, nearest neighbor matching with so-called uh, pre-trained models, the covariate already defined. And then we asked the question, like, can we actually learn the covariate while we're performing statistical matching? And then the answer is like, yes, we can We can do that. And this is the, the diagrammatic uh, visualization of this joint uh, covariate learning and statistical matching. There is an issue in terms of like, you know, how do you do uh, matching in a scalable manner? Because when you do learning while doing uh, matching or you're doing matching while doing learning, you need to do matching on a lot of data points. And how do you do that in a scalable manner? And that was the main contribution of the paper. And we show that this it's actually really good to, to join to jointly do statistical matching while learning the, the covariate or the features or the description of your uh, data point. Uh, in terms of the visualization, uh, it's it's slightly different comparing to the previous method because this particular uh, matching already take into account the, the the target tax as well that you wanted to predict, for example, whether a person is blown or not blown. And then uh, the next step, uh, just have two slides. Is this is the targeted invariance with implicitly defined targets? So uh, before I was mentioning that you know you define for the target. What is the target? Is it the background? Uh, land and water? Is it the background of South America and Asia? Or is it the demographic attribute, uh, a male and a female? But sometimes we, we, we can't do that or, or we want it to be more flexible in terms of like, we don't have to define this target uh, beforehand. So this is a work in progress with uh, Jeng, uh, Anise and, and, and Miles. So what we are showing is just like, you know, 
this is uh, some alluding some 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 result that this is this red curve is you know uh, a particular uh, standard algorithm that just now I said about the ERM that's the first line and this dot 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 this is the result with using uh, the algorithm previously described with explicitly defined target. And what other things that is this bump? Actually, our new algorithm that is currently under development, that the algorithm doesn't see or doesn't need to be told what is the particular target, male and females, but it can still achieve the same uh, robust accuracy. This is the, the the accuracy in the worst subgroup. The same worst accuracy, despite despite uh, not being explicitly uh, tell about what is the target. And the secret ingredient is we, we, we try to adjust the frequency response of the model. And the frequency is not about uh, spatial frequency in terms of image, but actually the frequency of prediction function. We can adjust uh, the response frequency, uh, adjusting in terms of the uh, eigenvalue of that particular response frequency to try to really take into account because some of those uh, uh, invariant that we want to define background, demographic attribute, they're usually easier to learn. And how can we adjust the our algorithm so that not focusing on those uh, features that is easy to learn, but also focus on the harder to learn as well, because the harder to learn is the one that is correspond to the object, correspond that is like, you know, that is meaningful information that will be generalized between training and deployment. And with that, I just wanted to summarize that, you know, the title, what I'm saying is from algorithmic robustness to algorithmic fairness and back. And uh, next line is just, we can do that via invariances because we can have a targeted invariances that can uh, give us robustness and fairness. So with that, I would like to thank you for uh, sticking with uh, me and looking forward for any clarification that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Novi. That's fantastic. And thank you for keeping to time and covering such a big uh, range of topics. If people want to ask questions, please put your hand up and I'll, I'll ask you to come and um, ask them directly to Novi. But while we're waiting for that, um, maybe I have a one or two comments. I mean, I think one of the things we found really helpful in our initial discussions with you in person were the because informatics and machine learning rarely talk to social sciences, but actually we realized that the kind of anal statistical analysis that yeah. you were doing on these types of visual data, which is not the types of data we normally yeah. work with, there were lots of similarities in sophisticated visual methods that we um, shared, we could talk to yeah. each other about. Um, I see Richard's got his hand up. So I'll hand over, first of all, to Richard, so he gets a chance to speak, and then I'll follow up with what other question I had about this. Richard. Thanks, Jackie. And thanks, Novi. That was really, really interesting. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a kind of question about a sort of application in a way. So, mm -hmm. you know, supposing in Digit, we were trying to understand who gets appointed to be yeah. CEO of a top 500 company. Yes. And then you're concerned about gender balance there. But your training data only has 5% of women in those positions. Yes. And so you're effectively saying you're, you, what you're doing is you're kind of matching the women in your training data with similar men to yeah. kind of balance that yes. in some way. Is yeah. So, so this is one approach uh, that we are presenting. Yes, that's exactly, uh, you know, because the data creation process, of course, is always uh, not ideal. I mean, like if we have ideal uh, data creation process, then, you know, we are not in the real world. <laughs> we, we just take whatever our data, but we need to do something about it so that we get robustness, we get fairness. And one approach is, uh, in fact, like, yes, try to find a match that I said, like among that 5%, what will be the closest match of the uh, uh, male uh, population and, and use that match data set to regularize the algorithms. So to, to, to make sure that the algorithm will be performing well between training and the deployment. In your loss function, in your, like, you know, in the standard machine learning, you still use the whole training data set that you have, because like in general, you don't want to throw away your training data. I mean, uh, I mean, like what, what you wanted to do is like, take that training data, define your uh, targeted invariance and use that to, to, to regularize your models 
to to the to the effect that you are uh, wanting to be uh, the changes that you want to be because if you don't regularize then you will just replicate as what you said like you know in that particular application then you will just replicate your training data it, it, is there still a problem that if you just have very sparse amounts of data for certain groups in you know how many female chancellor of exchequers has ever been is zero so you just don't have any observations for example yeah, yeah. for that kind of task yeah. and that must kind of change the accuracy of the models i guess yes you? that's that's actually a very good uh uh point uh yeah so this is one of the questions that we are asking was <laughs> Uh, we call it like invisible uh, a demographic uh, problem. So this is when when your training data. I mean, you sometimes have very limited, but sometimes you just don't have it as well. You have a zero uh, uh, data points on that. How can we still uh, define like appropriate uh, uh, targeted invariance to to handle this? Of course, it will not be perfect, but but the idea is like your models. It's 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 an iterative process. You have the models, you train it. You use that models to, to to define the next time step, and hopefully that next time step would make it closer to your ideal. And then you you, you make it again the iteration of t plus two, and then you make it t plus three, and that's when you consider a machine learning model as a as a dynamic uh, kind of process. Then you know you started with zero, of course, but then you will get there. But if you don't do anything with your algorithm, then you will deviate to 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 the idealized things that you wanted to achieve. So the, the answer is it's difficult, but we are. This is one of the some of the research question uh, that we are uh, asking. That's great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, can I ask? Um, do, uh, do, you, do you want to take your slide down just so we can see everybody? And Will Hunt, you've got a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Novi. It's yeah, really interesting, um, and um, uh, yeah, good explanation of so a practical way that you can try and minimise the, uh, you know, address this problem. Um, so, just thinking of a project that we worked on a while ago, which was looking at how an organisation was using machine learning to um, predict who might be good to hire. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and what they had lots and lots of data yeah. on people that they had hired previously yeah. and because then they have data on how long they stayed in post so yeah. like if they stayed in post for 90 days or more yeah. obviously they have complete data for all those that they hired yeah. um, and they train this algorithm to predict yeah. what um what factor what what people what factors predict who would be in post for that amount of time um and one of the things we said, so we I, I sort of came across this this kind of some of these potential issues in um in some of the literature that I think you had kind of suggested. And um I think in in we one of the things we said to them that was potentially an issue is that um if there's a systematic difference between those that that you've trained the data set on and those that you actually want to apply it to. So yeah. for in this case, those that you've hired. And those yeah. that you didn't hire um is that does that create a sort of potential problem for um you know how accurate and and how well your yeah. algorithm performs when you want to apply it to people who are you don't know whether you would hire them or not it, you, you know what i mean so some you'll hire and some you won't kind of thing so in here it's like uh uh, as I was trying to emphasize, like I think we have a problem about the fairness, a robustness, it just because of that. Like uh, there is this out of distribution generalization, like the training and the deployment uh, data or distribution, they are different, uh, and and different in the sense like of course we wanted the deployment or or the, the test to be you know the the idealist case. Like we we don't want to stay the same. I mean like you know if you wanted to to to, to test it in. In the in the algorithm hiring algorithm that is the same like I mean it's still many more uh, male than females then you know there is no discrepancy in that and and this is actually one of the main uh, issue when uh, Jackie was also asking about the assessment of the algorithm the main difficulty in here is that when we train the algorithms and then when we deploy it when we assess that particular algorithm the, the our deployment data set or our test data set it might not be the right test data set because somehow it might still be taken from the same uh, uh, distribution that that 
you are trying to avoid or something like that. So that's when you heard something like about fairness, accuracy threat or fairness, performance threat off or something. It's, it's not necessarily a threat off. It's a threat off because you are using your test data set to test your performance that is similar to your training data because you try to deviate from your training data and then you test it on the data set that is very similar to your training data. Of course, there is a reduction in the performance, right? But just the way to define like what would be a good idealized uh, task deployment data set, that would be the crucial things. And I guess this come, comes back to the my answer to, to Richard. Like, I think we just need to, to see it as this is a, a dynamic process, like you know, you you have your training data, and then you 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 try to assess it in the t t plus one, and then you try to take into account that updated version, and then see how is the t plus two. But in in general, like you know, it's not only about defining what is fairness, how to achieve this fairness, but also in terms of like assessing it, but. If we start asking, like you know, just dissecting the the the, the information, because typically in, in machine learning, the main issue is like we just consider average performance. On average, everything looks good. So what is we are trying to say, or what the community uh, of of algorithmic fairness and bias try to say is like you dissect it a bit more on the demographic attributes, and when you assess the performance, go and see that uh, the the discrepancy in the demographic attributes. And then you notice. Uh, things are not looking uh, so good anymore, and that's then we need to 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 to, to make changes and, and to do something about it. Yeah, not a straightforward uh, answer because not a straightforward question as well. It's very tricky. Yeah. But to, so just to cover, so you're basically saying there's like an iterative process. Yes. You deploy yes. it a bit, check yes. it, deploy yes. it a bit. Yes, exactly. Kind of because like yeah. the, the main thing in here is like you sometimes there is a problem called one-sided. Uh, uh, data set as well. So for example, when you're talking about the hiring algorithm, you, you use algorithm actually to predict the uh, the, the performance uh, of a particular person, right? This particular person will be having excellent performance. That's why you should hire it. But those that never get hired, we will never know whether their performance is bad or, or, or good. So that's the problem with this one-sided because like, you know, we learn only for those people that get the loan whether they will be, be able to pay back the loan or not. But those people that never get the loan, they will never get uh, the chance. I mean, they always be predicted they, they cannot pay back the loan because they just never get the loan. So this one-sided problem is, is very difficult to solve it in a static case. So you need to consider this dynamic iterative process things. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, that's really fascinating. Steve Rolf has got a question, which he may be able to ask in a minute, but I want to kind of abuse my position here a little bit. Um, and it doesn't matter if we run over a little bit either. Uh, so, and also just to kind of position your work in relation to what we're doing. So really you're working at the really the front end of the most complex data we could use, which is visual data, because of the complexity of all of the signs within even any single kind of image and how each should be coded. If we now, uh, and it kind of really illustrates the when we watch television and we see the police identifying all facial recognition so easily. I think your work shows that it's not quite as simple as that, but right. um, maybe it is. But uh, but if we were kind of to step out to a lower level of quality data in the sense of like more textual data that can be so we can take qualitative data like from text and yeah. what we need to do is uh, make it numerical data. Yeah. So if you're a woman, if you're a man, it's on a job application, it will have that, or if yeah. you're black or white or whatever ethnicity, whatever yeah. qualifications you have, whatever social demographic. So is it what your work is doing is really to check is the algorithmic sorting, how accurate and reliable it is. So is that easier to do with text data than with the visual data? Because the text data could be the uh, what you call the uh, things you want a variance or could mm -hmm. be codified or simplified much simpler. Mm -hmm. Is it easier yeah. to do that than it is with yeah. what you're doing with the visual data? Uh, uh, Jackie, thank you for this question. Like uh, the way I present it, maybe it's a bit misleading in the sense like actually these frameworks, uh, including the papers that uh, that I cited there, uh, we apply to the uh, uh, image data. We also apply to the text data, text conversation. Like this is uh, the text data is like a standard. Uh, data set, so-called toxicity uh, data set. So this is like taking the uh, comment or discussion 
uh, in the discussion post, and then whether this is a toxic comment or non-toxic comment, and then like you know whether it, it in the comment it refer to some specific demographic attribute. So we applied the same uh, technique as well because in in general, uh, a machine learning models is is following the same pipeline. Like when you have the data curation process and then you, you try to learn some representation, whether it's image representation or text representation, we also do uh, from tabular, like standard tabular uh, data set where the statistical matching uh, usually comes from. Like, you know, when we have this particular data point, what would be uh, the features, the height, what would be the, the weight, et cetera. So we, 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 we try to apply it across different uh, data modality and then showing that you know, whatever uh, the concept or whatever the technique that we are trying to, 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 to do is, it's so-called modality agnostic. So it should be uh, applicable to the image, should be applicable to the text, should be applicable to tabular. And, and as answering specifically like your question, whether it would be easier with the image, it would be easier with the text. I think that's all data set uh, specific. And, and in here it's like, what we can do with the techniques that, for example, matching or some things that have some capability, we can visualize something. Example of the maths, something. Example of the maths of the tabular data point. Example of the maths of the text. Then it 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 gives us a bit more information about like what do we do to include this uh, invariance, whether it makes sense or not, uh, or whether we are expecting that or not uh, by by visualizing this example of maths uh, sample. Could I just ask to follow up to check if I understood it? So yeah. the kind of methods you're uh, developing here are really ways of auditing the algorithm to say, is the algorithm doing a good job or not? That's a short version of what you're setting uh, up. Uh, both, uh, uh, Jackie. So auditing plus mitigating. Auditing plus addressing. So because like when you define this targeted invariance, when you do this uh, maths data set, for example, and use it as regularization, or you define or uh, changing the response frequency of the models that correspond to addressing or mitigating after you audit and you see there is some issue uh, the methods that i was describing there are actually specifically looking into how to address those issues okay good right i'll hand over to steve for the last question if your uh, your connection's working if not i'll i'll read it out for you yeah yeah thanks thanks very much uh, for for an excellent presentation um, sorry if I keep freezing, but in, in essence, the, the short version is, can you use this sort of uh, matching technique for safety critical uh, uses like self-driving cars, you know, areas where you absolutely can't have a 1% error rate because that's too high, people would be injured. Uh, yeah. is, is this robust enough to, do, to, to use for those kinds of applications or, yeah. or not? So I mean, like this is this is all the motivating examples there, right? Like you know, safety criticals, uh, and 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 things that is affect uh, human outcome, right? Even like you know, the loan, uh, uh, hiring. I would consider that a safety uh, a critical. You know, it's it's depend on like you know what would be the outcomes uh, of of myself and the idea of like this algorithmic fairness, algorithmic bias. I think is all trying to address that particular safe uh, safety critical question. But unfortunately, like with the safe driving, like what of the uh, the methods that that people are trying to do is just that you know train uh, the models with very very large data set because like you know you can perhaps achieve a robustness uh, extra with respect to uh, safe uh, self driving with a very large data set but i was just showing that there maybe like you know you need to have defined uh, a targeted invariance and 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 that's you know one way uh, whether it's it's applicable or not yes i mean it tried to go into that particular direction but whether it's it's enough uh, with this particular specific uh, self-driving uh, application, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, we haven't uh, really tested or tried out with this, you know, uh, safe driving uh, application. But one thing that that I, I noticed is like uh, in the self-driving, I noticed some of the policy that you don't really allow uh, uh, a task with respect to uh, kids, with respect to children or something like that. But in fact, this is related to like, you know, the invisible uh, zero information of the data. If you, of course, there is some uh, reasoning of why not involving children or something like that in, in terms of the performance uh, assessment or in terms of the training. But then, uh, I mean, in the real world, in the deployment, you, you have that particular uh, demographic that actually going to be missing and, and that's actually one of the most critical uh, question about uh, robustness fairness 
in the context of self-driving. I'm afraid I have to call it to uh, an end, our, our session today. But Novi, can I thank you on behalf of all of us? Because we always find uh, listening to you and hearing about what your, you and your team are doing absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you very much. That we are going to be able to now we've uh, got more access and everything that we have a more more of these discussions to see how we can collaborate together. And I know there's some collaboration we're working on looking uh, with the Bank of Indonesia that you're leading and doing on um, how useful uh, accountants and people working in fintech are founding, finding AI in terms of some of the decision making they're doing there. So maybe we'll have you back to tell us the results of that when you've uh, found out if the accountants have worked out if all the money's still in the bank. <laughs> Absolutely, very very happy to and and uh, looking forward to have more interaction uh, with uh, Digit uh, Research Center and like yeah, so we are all back on campus and and hopefully uh we'll be able to have more many more interaction I hope so, so. and can i tell that the rest of you know next week is it the, i think it's next week the 21st we have uh yeah oh no the 12th of july pardon me it's a couple of weeks time we have some of my german colleagues and dutch colleagues who are going to be talking about their new book on digitalization and the future of the welfare state 